my name is Michel Chaudron. I currently work at a uh, university in Leiden. And it is my pleasure to give a guest lecture in the uh, series uh, of this course in Eindhoven. The topic of today will be uh, assessing uh, architecture quality. I have a brief uh, introduction of myself. On it, uh, you can read that I, that I have been a lecturer in, uh, in Eindhoven for almost uh, 10 years. Actually, I left uh, about uh, two years ago. So if, the, if you studied already uh, two years ago in the master's phase, you could have seen me. Otherwise, I'm a new phase. Uh, three years ago? <laughs> so uh, since, uh, since two or three years, I'm uh, in charge of a master's program in, uh, in Leiden called ICT in Business which mixes IT with uh, business topics. My research interests are, and they were already uh, for some years, software architecture. So it fits very well with the topic of the course. Uh, also look at enterprise architecture, so, uh, and system architecture. You also see a bit in products. Enterprise architecture is uh, basically the same idea but in targeting at the, uh, the IT system in uh, companies. So my interests are in how can you assess the quality of an architecture uh, with sp in particular looked at uh, how do you do that for architectures that are represented using UML. I'm assuming that you are familiar with UML. Yeah, okay. Um, we're also looking at uh, the impact of using architecture. Do you actually manage to do your projects in a better way? Yeah? Do, you, do you achieve a higher quality or a better productivity in your project through the use of architecture? Um, and one of the studies we're currently doing is uh, looking at architecture in offshoring. The, the design that you write down here in the Netherlands and you send it to developers abroad like India or China, do they understand the stuff in the, in the manner that we intend it? Uh. Okay, just for those of you who think Leiden is abroad, it is uh, in Amsterdam, not so far away from Amsterdam, close to Schiphol. And I wanted to give an uh, atmospheric uh, impression of uh, what it looks like uh, during the, the summer months. It's a popular location for students to, uh, to have a drink. Unfortunately, the computer science building is outside of the city center, so we have to enjoy it some other time. Um, so today's uh, agenda is uh, a discussion on what's quality. Maybe some of you have, uh, have had some of this discussion in a course on software engineering, so it's not going to be very extensive. Um, I will discuss requirements and and quality. Why? Because with requirements you have to start thinking about quality and determine the target for your project. Then we talk about uh, software metrics, is uh, how you do uh, measurement in software in general. Uh, and then we'll focus that on how can you use metrics related to assessing quality at an architectural level. Uh, feel free to uh, raise your hands uh, during the um, a lecture. Um, I'm happy to take uh, questions. I'm, I'm, I'm here for you. So uh, if you raise your hand, we can do it uh, one by one. What's quality? Uh, I illustrate this on the using uh, two cars. One is my car, the other car is my wife's car. Uh, we have different perception on uh, quality. Uh, I like to do it for uh, shopping and my wife likes to uh, drive around the circuit. So uh, you can guess whose car is whom. Uh, clearly they have different objectives for uh, quality. Yeah? They're engineered for, a for achieving different goals. So maybe uh, uh, some people from the audience can respond, okay, wh what's the quality of a car? How do you measure it or how do you assess it? Can anyone make a suggestion? Lifetime, Lifetime. so how long it uh, remains operational. Yeah, that can, that can be uh, quality uh, characteristics. Cost of maintenance, absolutely. Yeah, if it's higher cost, then probably it's lower quality. Okay, here the, the gentleman mentions it depends on your expectations, depends on what you need. So I'll disclose that I have two children in the age of uh, two to five, which makes one car a bit more practical than the other car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, one of them is a toy car. But okay. This gentleman over here. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Okay. S safety. Yeah. Yeah. If, uh, trunk space. 
okay, user satisfaction. So I'll, there's there's two categ three categories of answers. Uh, there's user satisfaction. There's depends on your expectation, and the other are almost measurable characteristics of the product that you build. So the discussion on quality uh, can be summarized in those lines. There's been some literature on the area, and um, it mentions these perspectives on quality. Um, one of is uh, manufacturing-based. Uh, uh, it says, okay, first you have to define uh, a specification, and if you meet the specification, then we say you meet the quality uh, requirements. Okay, so that also makes specification up front very important because that's where you define your target. Then there's product based, and that's we discussed that. Um, it can say uh, what's the acceleration? Yeah, it's like if it's if it's if it has these characteristics, then uh, then I like it uh, a lot. Or if it has large trunk space, then I like it a lot. Mentions a, a user-based fitness for use uh, that relates to okay how to what degree does a system help a user perform his or her task and you look at the perspective from the task and the way that the user performs a task and then there's transcendent and that relates also to the user experience you cannot really measure it but you have to ask the people that use the system to what degree they uh, they like it or not like it. Yeah, so it's these different uh, angles on quality, uh, all of those exist. And, uh, and finally, there's also a, a, a value, an economical perspective on quality. It says, well, you have to always balance the, uh, the cost of achieving a certain level of quality with the amount of uh, investment that you need to do to achieve it. So it's not the case that uh, there's a, unif a universally accepted definition when you see people talk or hear people talk about quality, you have to uh, interpret which style of quality they are talking about. Now for software, we've introduced quality, we've practiced on a car. What makes quality software? Suggestions from the audience. Yeah, and the number of bugs per uh, thousand lines of code is a measure that is sometimes used. High number of bugs, I suppose, is poor quality, and a low number of bugs is good quality. Who knows what's the best number? What's the is a defect density? Uh, what's the best defect density that we can do universally? Uh, NASA software in the space rockets. It's about three to four defects per thousand lines of code. It's interesting if you know that the airplane has about uh, 10 million lines of code. That always makes it a nice experience. Uh, okay, so the number of defects. Any anyone else? Other suggestions? Or what's? I mean software. Software system. Yeah. So you can look at it from okay. It's it is the people that use it, but also the people that have to maintain it. Yeah, performance and latency. Yeah, so those are characteristics that you can meet, that you can measure from an operational system yeah, when the system is in use. Yeah. Yeah, usability is a characteristic of the quality. Okay, it relates to quality, but doesn't necessarily by itself say anything about the quality. I mean, if you've covered more of the code, then you know more, but you need to at least combine it with the amount of defects that you have found. Uh, but in general, it's the case, if you have larger coverage, you know more about the defects that are present. Anyone else? Yeah? Yeah, I think documentation is fair to say. If you have good documentation, that's better quality software, uh, certainly for the maintenance phase, uh, will save you effort in, uh, in maintaining the system.
Uh -huh. Okay. So the fact is that software does evolve uh, as much as uh, other uh, as other artifacts that are built, uh, and software does decay, decay, so it becomes worse over time unless you actively maintain its structure. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll move on. Um, some of these uh, have been mentioned. Uh, the program does uh, meet the expectation, so it computes the output that you expect. Um, it doesn't crash. Um, or you can say the, the number of uh, defects that you find after so many hours. Those are certainly from a, from a user perspective, you can say are quality related properties. Um, there exists also a, a quality model called, uh, or standardized as uh, ISO 9216. And this quality model is a hierarchical model which has quality in the root and then decomposes it into uh, characteristics and then sub-characteristics and then into attributes that are ultimately measurable. So here the tree has been flattened and you see uh, different uh, branches of the tree. So it defines uh, quality as consisting of functionality, reliability, usability, efficiency, and uh, items like performance fit, fit under here, maintainability, which is more related to uh, the software engineers and how they have to use the software, and also portability. You see that each of these characteristics is further refined into sub-characteristics, like for efficiency, it is resource behavior, yeah. so utilization, how much of my resources are being used. And the next level that is not shown on this slide is that resource behavior is again refined in some unit that is measurable. Yeah, question. No, that's correct. Old standard. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, actually, it is uh, here. It is, it is in the list. So it, it was, um, um, I'll, I'll get back to this topic though, uh, because um, I'm, I'm sure there are some more illities that, that we can think of. Um, and actually, um, some other people started doing this same discussion and say, oh, we can think of other properties. Um, this is also a quality model where it has quality in the, the root of the tree and it fans out into measure into attributes that are measurable and it shows that there are, there are several of these quality models. Uh, this is McCall's quality model. I'll hand out the slides so you can read it later but you can see it's the same structure. It has these characteristics that are refined. Beam's quality model. So I'm not going to go over all the details of all of these but I use it to illustrate the idea. Uh, at some point, people started realizing uh, it's not going to work to have this universal notion of quality. Uh, we can have a classification of all types of properties that are relevant in some cases, and you can merge those and make a very long list. But it's certainly not the objective to meet all quality properties or make them optimal in some sense at the same time. So if you are to design a system, you have to think what are the objectives for your project, is it security? Uh, is it performance? Is it uh, reliability? Is it availability? And then how, how do you want to operationalize this? Eh? In what way do you want to measure this such that you can track it? Um, maintainability, also important property. So this, this idea of you can, uh, you can use these, but you have to define it for yourself. Um, it is uh, defined in, a, I suppose, one of the most recent approaches which is goal question metric approach. And it's okay, if you have to define your goals, you have to define which questions you want to answer and how you're going to measure those. Uh, and this paradigm is, is even more universally applicable than to uh, software design itself. Um, this slide shows the different standards that exist in the area of uh, software quality. And you have to imagine that uh, for each of these standards, there is this volume of um, books that you can find templates and checklists and everything. Um, some of them, uh, so ISO 9000 is a very general quality uh, system, which is also used in production systems. Uh, there's particular military standards, uh, there's process-oriented standards, um, 
software improvement standards. And what it says is, there, is there's no single uh, answer to it, but there's many answers. Yeah, question. What about the talent? Do you see that in the future? I think has has influenced or is derived from. Yeah, so if there's an if there's an if we look at uh, Spice, then it was influenced by this standard, and it was influenced by ISO as a standard, so or inspired by, uh, derived from, in some degree. Yeah. Uh, if you were to look at a particular project and see how quality is uh, ensured, well maybe some of you have seen this slide in the software engineering course, and it's a simplification of a waterfall process where there starts with a feasibility study and it goes down to uh, coding, testing and operation. Then ideally, at each step, there is some quality assurance activity. Many people will first say, yeah, you have to do uh, testing. But at every step, you have to think about the quality of the system. And particularly during the architecture phase, you have to think about quality because the decisions that you take in the architecting phase will have the largest impact on the entire project. Yeah, because there's a, large num there's a large amount of activities, subsequent design decisions that depends on the early decisions that you take. What you can also uh, uh, infer from this slide is, okay, if we do testing here, then what do we do in the earlier stages? Which methods and techniques can we take from the shelves for uh, ensuring quality? Anyone have any suggestions? Review, yeah, review and inspection. So there's human-based techniques. Whenever you have defined uh, requirements or an analysis model, you can ask a colleague or an expert in the domain, can you look at my document and can you try to find uh, errors? So currently that's mostly uh, uh, expert-based and ideally we would like to have uh, other techniques that are maybe more objective, more repeatable, uh, no, I don't. Okay, that's an interesting uh, suggestion. It's generally not considered a quality assurance technique, although if in projects that aim for high assurance, it is uh, sometimes is recommended in a quality standard. It's more generally considered to be an, uh, a design technique, but uh, formal methods enable you to, to uh, reason about the design and prove properties in a mathematical way. So they're a, a, a complementary approach to uh, finding errors. Most of the formal methods will address the issue of correctness though. And you also have to think about performance, maintainability, security, and all the other issues. So that's it's a it's a it's a partial answer, and it's a, I'll get back to it. Bec <laughs> yes. So that's it. It's as you mean, it's a style of testing. Yes, but performance oriented. Uh huh. Okay, I, th I think it's still called testing in practice. You can do security testing or performance testing, but, but yeah, certainly you can do testing not only for the functionality, but also for these, for these other properties. Um, so if you were to take these uh, quality uh, books from the shelves, then they're often not so popular amongst software engineers because there's a large amount of uh, bureaucracy and you have to film uh, many forms. And if there's no tool support, then it takes a lot of effort to fill and then uh, it's considered a bureaucratic activity. So there's um, one reason why it's often not very popular and uh, however, it is important. I, I see some people recognize it from the software engineering project. Um, I wanted to show you my list of illities, which I've collected over the years in addition to the quality models that I've shown. It goes to illustrate that there is many, many, many type of illities, uh, quality properties that can be uh, can be important for your uh, 
for your project. Okay, I, I can explain it, but I'll do it during the break. Uh, uh, so this is the essence of, uh, of architecting, I think, in a nutshell. Uh, there is this uh, balancing act that you have to do amongst different requirements. Uh, there's diff some stakeholder in the project will want high security and some other stakeholder will want a high performance and some other will want a low cost. And as an architect, you have to first elicit all these needs, then you have to figure out which ones are important, whether there's any contradictions, whether they're reconcilable, whether it's possible to make a system that meets all requirements. You have to figure out which design decisions impact these different qualities. Yeah, well, if, I, if I invest in a firewall, it clearly it becomes more secure, but it's also more expensive and slower. So that's a design decision that impacts typically two or more uh, quality properties. And this is the essence of the engineering problem, that you have multiple contradictory goals and you have multiple means. Eh? In the previous lectures, you have seen some patterns and some styles that you can use for either for performance or security or maintainability. And as an architect, you need to find a recipe for combining these in order to meet these system requirements. Everyone have an understanding of this problem? Yeah, there are qu questions about it? Okay. Um, and um, in an engineering setting, the amount of resources that you have is constrained. So you should not try to go for necessarily optimal quality. Uh, maybe there's a business case that says, well, this level of quality is good enough. Or our initial release has to give this level of quality. And as a project leader, you have to balance this. And say you have to be aware of the fact that there are trade-offs. And who knows the best strategy if your project is late? What's the best strategy for being on time? Say again? Say again? Delay the deadline. No, sorry, that's not, that's not a parameter that you control. No, it's, it's do less. Meet fewer requirements. Yeah, yeah, yeah that actually, that's also a possibility. Uh, that happens, unfortunately, in practice uh, too often, uh, that people compromise on quality. But that's, that's not my, my advice. My advice is to scale down in the requirements. Uh, you can still meet uh, some requirements, but at a good level of quality. But you have to do you have to do less. Um, so I already mentioned it, but I want to emphasize the importance of thinking about uh, quality during the requirements and design stage of a project. Um, maybe some of you have seen the slide. On the x-axis, it shows the phases of the project, and on the y-axis, it shows the cost of repairing a defect when found at that stage. If you repair a defect in a requirement stage, it costs relatively little. Uh, if you do it at a later stage, in the maintenance stage, it's about 16 times more expensive to repair it. So the economics of this picture are you have to limit the lifetime of the defects. And thus, you also need to try to find methods for detecting defects early in the development. I mentioned that there's a, an economic trade-off in uh, targeting quality. Uh, you have to be aware of how much quality is, is good enough for my project. And um, this... Um, graph shows two lines, actually three. Uh, the achievement costs are the, that's the cost that you need to spend on achieving a certain level of quality. And there's non-conformance cost. This is the penalty that you achieve because your system doesn't meet the requirements. Eh? It may result in a runtime error, it may result in more maintenance effort. Okay, at some point, if you achieve a higher quality, closer to perfection, and I suppose that here is perfection, then the non-conformance costs become low. Yeah? There's a low penalty in not being perfect. 
whereas the amount of effort that you need to invest in further improving the system becomes very high. So actually you need to have an, a notion of the achievement cost and a non-conformance cost and find a sweet spot which is the minimum of the sum of these two. And unfortunately there is no uh, fixed calculation that will tell you what this is. Uh, I suppose because it's an abstraction. It, it, it could, there's no statistical data about it. Uh, yeah. I suppose in theory you're right. Well, I've never seen a system that has no non-conformance costs because there's... Exactly. So, uh, but I don't think it. I don't think it should prevent you from understanding the uh, the message of the slide. So that, that, that the bottom line is that that perfection is in general not the most economical option. Okay, let's move into the area of uh, requirements. Uh, earlier we discussed that if a system meets the requirements we can say it's of good quality so th that's a relative definition eh? so here's my requirements and here's my system and if it meets it and you say it's okay eh? it's the best I can do because this is what you said I should make and I'm this is uh, how I do it and uh, th that means that through your requirements you define your, your target to define what it is that you want to achieve. And for this reason, it's important in the requirement stage to, to think about it. And, um, many projects in practice, they fail, and this is famous data from a, a report by the Standish Group. And they collected statistics about why projects fail, and I highlighted the categories that are actually related to uh, requirements. Either the requirements were unclear, or they were unrealistic, or they were changing too much over time. And altogether, they account for uh, the largest category of root causes for not meeting uh, project objectives. So before we go into the technical design and all the other methods that we have, I want to emphasize that you should start thinking about the quality in the requirements phase. Because if you haven't defined your target, it doesn't matter where you shoot, right? Who knows these uh, requirements on requirements? Yeah? So I, I teach the same slide in, in my course in Leiden. And then during the break, I ask the students to write down an example requirement. And usually there's not a single one that meets this, okay? It's, it's also one of my favorite exam questions. I uh, can suggest it to uh, Professor Lequin as well. But uh, it is really something that you need to practice. It's easy to remember, smart. Uh, people in industry often use it. It has to be uh, specific, measurable, acceptable, realistic, and, and testable. Okay? You have seen it. Uh, I, I strongly recommend that you practice with it. Uh, so... Suppose that you have mastered this notion of, uh, of SMART and you know from your software engineering course what a requirements document uh, looks like. Then the next question is, okay, uh, is my list of requirements, is it complete? Uh, most often it's not. How about consistent then? Uh, at least there sh I should expect that there's no contradictions in the requirements. Yeah? Otherwise I cannot logically build the system. Well, I haven't seen it yet. How about uh, fix them? Eh? At least once we agree that these are the requirements, then, then we can continue. Uh, no, sorry. No success there. Prioritized, I can say. Which ones are the most important? Uh, sometimes. Well, but even that might not be fixed. Who knows what traceable means? When is the requirement traceable?
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's related to that. So, I, in the ideal case, you have a chain where you say, okay, this is my. Maybe you can start with a business case, but let's start with the user requirements. The user has this requirement that has this implication on the software or on the system. And through these design decisions, I create a system that satisfies this. So actually, when you make a design decision, you should link it back to the requirements. Okay, by making this decision, can I argue that I will meet this uh, requirement? Yeah, so you can have uh, either tables or matrices where you can say, okay, through this uh, design decision, I'll meet this objective. And through this design decision, I'll meet that objective. Uh, furthermore, we know that requirements actually change over time. That's actually a, a, a phenomena that there's a co-evolution. Yeah? By making some design decisions, you also learn new requirements. Uh, you can think of a project uh, road pricing. Uh, it in the Netherlands, is kilometer having electronic road pricing, where you have to pay for driving your car on some part of the road. So I happen to know some details of the project. And one of the uh, principal decisions was whether it was going to work with a barrier, a physical barrier like you have in France, or with wireless communication. Uh, you can have a device in the car and device on the roadside and that would exchange, okay, I'm passing here, okay, you get this amount of payment. Um, this, this decisions, is it going to be a physical barrier or electronic communication, it would determine which other requirements would show up eh, because the barrier was anonymous and the privacy was ensured. But in electronic communication, there was uh, concerns about privacy and, and uh, security of the data. So it depended on which design decision was being taken. So it's not a linear process where you first define all the requirements and then design the architecture. There's an interaction where some parts of the design are being made and some new requirements emerge and you have them to manage them in concert. Um, the other message is that as an architect, you have to deal with a, uh, a large amount of uncertainty. Uh, hopefully with the requirements you can cover or at least define the design space that you need to target. But you have to be aware of the fact that you cannot know everything up front. And yet you have to make decisions, design decisions about which direction to go. So you have to as an architect, either build up experience or b build in options in your design. Okay, if I do this, then at least I'll, I'll keep open the option of using Java or .NET, or I'll keep up the option of using uh, MP3 or JPEG or uh, some, other, some other design options. Um. All right, so those were my, my main topics for the uh, first slot, for the first hour. It was quality and uh, quality and requirements. Any questions about those topics? It will be a good point because I'm moving on to the next topic. No? Okay. Next topic is uh, software metrics. If you like the topic, I uh, can definitely recommend uh, these two books. This book was written by a gentleman when we worked for a large um, IBM project. And it, uh, it focuses on all types of data that he collected during this project about how IBM performed uh, in that project, um, related to uh, how many defects they found and what it said about the quality of the system. So it's quite process oriented. Um, this book is a bit more product oriented. We say it, it tells you all types of way of measuring uh, software code or software design. And, um, I think both of them are in the library of the university here. So why, why do we do this measurement? Uh, computer science is in a way sometimes a bit uh, jealous of uh, physics. They have this nice set of uh, standard units for measuring uh, force and weight and uh, acceleration. And through these standardized units, all the theories fit very nicely uh, together. And uh, because of it, uh, physics is considered as the, the queen of sciences. Uh, well, why is informatics not the queen of sciences? It could be. Yeah, it's the emperor of science. So um, 
it can be summarized by this um, famous citation by uh, Lord Kelvin, uh, a physicist, who said, yeah, if you cannot measure it, we, we can, can't actually take you seriously as a science. So uh, for some time, the, the domain of software engineering has started to also collect data about the objects that they make uh, and try to come up with theories that, c that identify what are the important relations between the measurements that we can do in software. Yeah, and to start with, measuring size is already difficult. Yeah, you, can, you have length, this is about uh, we'll say a meter and a half. Okay, what's the size of software? Yeah, it's a lines of code. Okay, well that's one way. How do you define lines of code? You include comments, you include empty lines. Uh, what if you have multiple instructions on a line? It turns out that there's quite some variation in the way you can define lines of code. Maybe it depends on your programming language. If you do it in a C++, it might be more or less than if you do it in a functional language. Um, alternatives are uh, to look more at the functionality of the system and say that I measure size in terms of function points. Who's, who's heard of function points? Yeah, anyone else? So function points looks more at the perspective of the, the amount of input and output of a component and tries to approximate the complexity of the computation that takes place. And it's a unit that's often used in doing uh, estimations about how much uh, effort am I going to need to implement some system. So in addition to these uh, scientific uh, uh, inferiority complex of computer science, there's other motivations for measuring. And those are driven by pragmatic uh, 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 ideals, pragmatic perspectives. If you are to manage a project, then you want to first know that you meet your objective. And for that purpose, you need to have ways of quantifying your goals. The other goal is that yeah, during the process of working towards the system, you need to be able to measure how you're doing eh? because that's a way of risk mitigation. You have to manage the risk during the execution of the project. And if you just start and then after two years say, no, we missed it, yeah, it's a bit of a pity. So you want to measure and predict during the project. But this is introducing some terminology that you have to know in the domain of uh, measurement. A measure, a quantitative indication of the extent, amount, dimension, capacity, or size of some attribute. In Dutch, it is the maat. There's a measurement, the act of determining a measure. And there's a metric, there's a measure of the degree to which a system possesses a given attribute. And a metric you measure on an artifact, so lines of code, and it's an indicator of some property for instance, size or quality or something. So summarizing, uh, why do you do this for practical purposes? You want to control uh, running a project to understand what happens, uh, to compare to other projects for doing benchmarking or for predicting the, the outcome. In general, you find that metrics are often used by quality assurance people. Why? Because they want to find out which parts of your process are consuming many resources or are uh, injecting many defects in the process. And if you know where your defects are, then you can uh, target your quality assurance techniques. Here are some examples. Um, if you're a company, maybe some of you uh, have a small company that builds uh, websites, and you want to make a bid for uh, a project, then you have to estimate how much cost you're going to make. And you want to offer a price that is realistic, uh, competitive, but also with a margin. Um, another reason for looking at measurements at metrics is, uh, suppose that you switch to a new tool or new method of development, then you want to know whether it's going to actually lead to an improvement, yes or no. So that means that you need to collect data about how well you are performing in project, 
with and without uh, this te technique. You can use it for forecasting uh, staffing, maybe for predicting uh, the amount of maintenance that you need. Let's just show some examples. Um, in the area of software engineering, there's three uh, domains uh, generally uh, considered. One is the domain of the processes. You can measure the duration of a task or the number of changes in requirements. Uh, there's resources. I, think a, I don't like the term very much, but it usually relates to the people and the tools that are used. Maybe you can say the expertise is part of the resources in a project. And then there's product-related metrics. So pro products say something about the artifacts. Uh, it can be milestones that you deliver as part of a project. So you can start defining metrics based on the requirements document. How many do I have? Uh, but also on the architecture document, also on the implementation and on the test. Here are some more examples of process metrics. I, I've already mentioned effort per tasks. Uh, distribution of effort on software engineering tasks. How much time do I spend on requirements? How much time do I spend on um, designing? How much time do I spend on testing? We have actually looked at that uh, question for a particular project. Maybe some of you have seen this picture. Uh, is, it, is it familiar to some of you? From your software engineering course? I hope. No? Okay, I'll explain it. The picture comes from the, the RUP, the Rational Unified Process. It shows on the x-axis uh, time, which is divided into um, uh, iterations. Uh, on the y-axis, it shows the different activities in a project. So you have uh, business modeling, requirements, analysis and design, implementation, testing, uh, deployment, uh, change management, project management. And these waves, they are an indication by the developers of this method about how much effort you spend on uh, this activity in this phase. So clearly it shows that there's, that there's uh, higher points, more effort is invested in the early phase in the business modeling and in the requirements. And the testing happens uh, iteratively. So every time uh, some iteration has ended, there should be some testing uh, and so on. So implementation is very little in the beginning and then increases in elaboration and then is high during construction and very little in transition. So this is the, the theory that is in the textbook and in the, the sales uh, brochures. And then we started measuring that on an actual project. And this is the picture that came out. So I hope you can see it's uh, almost similar or not. That's actually very different. <laughs> So we were trying to see whether we could use this data for uh, assessing whether a, whether a project was performing very well or not. Have you remarked anything particular about it? Here, you mean here? Uh, yeah, so they, they peak towards the deadline of the project or towards the end of the project. Uh, basically, it indicates the start of panic. It's like, uh, we need to do lots of stuff uh, at the end of the project. Uh. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'd say relatively it's decent because the majority of the changes are in the beginning, or the majority of the effort, and there's little effort towards the end. But uh, analysis and design has a suspiciously high peak towards the end, which you shouldn't see. Uh, testing you were expecting. But um, yeah, for in particular, this part is, uh, is quite suspicious. Um, but ultimately, it turned out that we couldn't use it as a, as a very detailed diagnostic uh, approach because there were yeah, many, many external factors that influenced this. People would go on a holiday. People would become ill. The architect of the project was changed. And the client of the project decided to pause the project for a couple of months. So all of that you cannot see if you do uh, those basic measurements. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
here. Implementation that is not tested because there is no testing here. Yes. Well, at least this peak is, is not followed by some significant uh, testing effort. So yeah, maybe. But it turned out that it was actually sketched by some people on a whiteboard and they say, well, it looks good in our sales brochure. And uh, so, so some other people in uh, some uh, some other country, they decided to integrate the volume under these curves and to use it as a prediction. Uh, it wasn't meant in that way. Uh, so it well, it shows the power of a metaphor eh, because it's it suggests it suggests how you should do it, but it cannot actually be used in planning. Eh? It gives you an indication of how you should do it, but reality is uh, is very different. But I think this is a good uh, good point for a break. So I'll be around if you have any questions during the break. Otherwise, I suggest that we continue in 10-15 uh, minutes. That's from uh, industrial documentation, and it shows an architecture uh, somewhat anonymized from the actual documentation. So you can see it has it's a layered system where it has a presentation layer. It has apparently uses a browser and some authentication, and then there's a business layer and a persistence layer with some security. Uh, and within each layer, this is modeled as a UML package. You see more packages and their dependencies within uh, within a layer, and there's also dependencies from one layer to the next layer. And this particular system uses a a column on the on the right, which is common elements that shared functionality by all the uh, by all the layers. But I, the reason why I show the picture because I think it's nice. It's quite nice from the the pictures that I've seen. So I've 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 visited companies and knocked on your door. And, Can I see your architecture? And after they panic, they gi they give me some documentation and. Uh, and they say, oh, this is it, and often it's PowerPoint and uh, Visio pictures, and uh, sometimes they take a snapshot with a camera from the whiteboard, and they, they stick it into the documentation. But this is nice because of its simplicity. Uh, it shows elegance in layout. Uh, it's it's clear overview. And um, in one, uh, in one uh, say, oogopslag, uh, who helps me translate? blink of an eye, you can see, okay, this is a decent design. Uh, so it's something that you learn to do by practicing. Uh, maybe your first design will is not going to be like this. Uh, often uh, starting designers, they don't think in terms of the layering at all. They start making classes and then, then the class diagram grows and only later they think of uh, what, what happened to my layering. So you can, as an exercise, you can try doing, uh, start with the layering and see, okay, where, where do different classes fit? Um, it comes from an information system, but for an embedded type of system, the, the, the style of layering is not necessarily different. You have a data, a, the data layer could be data acquisition, so sensing. Uh, there would be a, a system logic layer, what's the main application? And there would be a presentation layer which interacts with the user. So the, the same type of layering is applicable. Um, so that's uh, a screenshot from real life. I want to continue with the uh, product metrics. So I started explaining before the break that uh, we can start measuring uh, the artifacts that we create in a, a system development project and that from measuring we can start understanding um, and try to approximate uh, or use measurements as an indicator for quality. Um, there's different types of measurements that are around. I'll show one example of uh, measuring algorithmic complexity. I'll try to focus on architectural or design complexity. This is the, one of the most classical metrics. It's called McCabe uh, complexity metric and it's based on the number of paths in a flow graph for some algorithm. 
my next slide has an actual con control graph. So you're supposed to start uh, here, and this is a branch. The control flow can go either here or there. So can, this is a path through the system and it stops here, and here's another path, and maybe here's another path. And the number of paths from start to exit in a method, procedure, or component is in this case defined as an approximation for the complexity. And if you uh, look at the mathematics, you can define the graph in terms of the number of edges and the number of nodes, and you can uh, do the mathematics. And the idea is that based on this metric, I have your question, come so back. Uh, based on this metric, you can um, uh, define some guidelines saying that the, the, the complexity of a method should never be higher than 10. We used to have a guideline that says uh, your method should fit in your screen, but with the advancement of uh, displays, uh, screens become too large. Too many lines fit in it. So uh, the other thing is if, if there's a high complexity, then... Uh, the working hypothesis is that high complexity correlates with high maintenance cost and a high defect density. Okay, there's a question. How would you cover the loops? Okay, if it's a, it's a loop with, uh, uh, with fixed um, interval, then it doesn't count, I think, because it's a single flow. But if it's a while or repeat loop, then it has a decision in it. Um, and the decision point is a branching point. Yeah. But this is a classical one. I think it was defined in the 60s or 1960s already. Yeah. So um, I've been arguing earlier that we want actually to do quality assessment early in the design phase. Whereas McCabe is algorithmic and it mostly it, it applies when you have um, invented the algorithm already maybe coded it, so you can, there's tools around that will calculate McCabe's metric for source code yeah, for Java or C++. But with, that's a bit late in the project, and we would like to see can we do measurements on the design, such that the design, uh, the, such that those measurements tell us something about the maintainability or the extensibility of the system. And the topics that we will look at are coupling and cohesion, which I think you have seen before. First of all, I wanted to summarize these design principles. They, they apply to software, and hopefully I, th I think you should have seen some of these in the context of software, but they apply similarly to a system as a whole. So you shouldn't think of these necessarily as software, but as system design principles. Uh, simplicity. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's easy to say what it is, but it's difficult to do. Uh, the picture I showed of the example was fairly simple. I can also show you some pictures that are not so simple. Just by looking at the picture, you can say, okay, well, if the picture is that complex, maybe the system is a bit complex. Separation of concerns. Is anyone that can explain to me what is separation of concerns? Well, I trust I'm not the first one in Eindhoven to discuss separation of concerns. Uh, Okay, can you use a bit more words? I think it's right, but... Uh-huh, yeah, okay. So the, the, the answer is you shouldn't combine functionality in one module because it's temporarily, temporarily related. That's true. Anyone else with a other explanation of separation of concerns? What does it say about the design of individual modules? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Did I, can I, could everyone hear that? Yeah. There's a comment here. Yeah. 
Yeah, reusability is also improved by having a separation of concerns. Uh, yeah. So how do you, how can you recognize in a design whether it has applied the separation of concerns? Or you can see it in the source code. Sorry. No? Okay. Well, yeah. can go on to discuss it. I'll come back to the question. Let's look at the next one. Information hiding. What's information hiding? Anyone that can explain it? Yeah. Gentleman over there. No? I think you've discussed the Parnas paper. I've seen it on the list of papers. So it ah, so, um, means most of you have read it. No? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's there's an abstraction that is offered at an interface, which tells what a component or what a function offers, and internally you make design decisions about how the component functions. Yeah, so there's it relates to separation of concerns, namely the separation between what and how. Uh, what uh, you can tell the outside world internally uh, you determine how for instance for sorting I can tell the outside world I do sorting and internally I could be quick sort or merge sort or bubble sort or yeah so that also indicates that for sorting quick sort is a poor name you should have sort as a name yeah? because it gives you the opportunity to internally change the strategy for sorting um, Parnas himself also explains it in terms of a secret. Every module should have a secret. And the secrets are actually the design decisions. The important design decisions in your system should be encapsulated. They should be hidden in individual modules, such that if you want to revise your design decision or if there's a need to change it, the other components that depend on this are not affected. And so it's a strategy for um, easing the design and limiting the impact of changes. Um, all of these uh, also relate to uh, modularity. Who can explain to me what is modularity? Not the usual suspects. Uh, someone else. Uh, must have seen it. Is it, I know it when I see it? Yeah. It's replacing one module with another module without too much effort? It's definitely related. So under, under what conditions is this not too much effort? Here's a module that uses some other module. If I want to replace this by some other, uh, then ideally I would not have to make any changes to this module M here. Uh, just if I keep the interface the same, then I can do a replacement. So if I have... Um, If I have many incoming dependencies, does it become easier or more difficult to do a replacement here? More difficult, yeah. So modularity, in a way, is related to uh, the amount of uh, interconnections between modules. Now, clearly, you can say, I define classes and a class is a module, but that's not, uh, that's not in the spirit of modularity. The idea is that the, the number of dependencies should be limited, should be small. Okay? And, uh, 
and ideally one module has one responsibility. Okay, um, this is sometimes again seen as a different um, explanation. Clearly, it relates to separation of concerns. Keep things together that belong together. Keep things that belong together in a single place, and so they, they shouldn't be spread uh, across the system. If you do separation of concerns, you'll probably do this. Okay, so the next uh, topic that I'm going to explain is related to uh, design metrics. And most of the design metrics will, will be an indicator of whether you have applied these design principles. Yeah? These design principles are generally considered to be a healthy, a good practice. And these metrics are going to be indicators. Okay. Here's a coupling. It shows the number of uh, modules, four modules, and the uh, lines between them, they denote coupling. Uh, there's a coupling between one module and another. If there's a dependency, it, one module uh, builds on a, a function of another module or it uses it in some other way, interacts with it. So here you see a relatively a high coupling for a small number of components, and here you see a low coupling. So you could approximate this by measurement. You just count the number of lines that's incoming and outgoing. So here it is uh, five, and for the same component here it is two. So same design, but with smaller uh, coupling. Okay, so this is the preferred design compared to this. So low coupling is good because it helps uh, replaceability I'll start over there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's an, uh, to start with, it's a, it's a, it's an explanation, but in. You, well, that depends. That depends. Uh, quite often, you see that uh, people program some dependency into a system that's actually not necessary or not needed. I think that Reiner Bril he gave a lecture on the um, a conformance between implementation and the design with the relation partition algebra, and it has a it has a definition, mathematical definition of the allowed dependencies, and in practice, you'll see that people. They'll build in, they'll build in, they'll program in dependencies that were not meant. So they increase the coupling in a way that was not intended and deteriorate the architectural design. Yeah. And often there is a way to reroute it. Yeah. Suppose there was a, I think you're referring to this link here. Because, hey, here it can use this, but here it's not possible. But maybe in this case the traffic goes via another component. I'm not in charge of the lights. Uh. Okay. So this this gives you an idea of the uh, the way in which uh, a dependency manifests itself. Uh. It can be that there's a reference to an attribute or to a service. Uh, method A has a reference to objects of another type. Or subclassing is also a dependency. Yeah? If, you're, if you have one class that's a subclass of another, then there's at least a, co at least a compilation dependency. Yeah? This, this class needs to be present when compiling this, otherwise it doesn't work. So one of the heuristics is uh, inheritance relations should never go across component boundaries. Can anyone imagine that? So inheritance is uh, one of my least favorite constructions in uh, architecture at all. If you have it in your design, okay, I can live with it, but please try to avoid it in your architectural design. Here's a counterpart of uh, coupling, it's cohesion. It shows two uh, 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 components. 
where there's uh, four or five uh, subcomponents. And this is, in this case, there's, con there's connections. In this case, there's no connections. It represents that they work together. Uh, this needs something that this offers. This needs something that this, this offers. In this case, this could, this could be different type of functionality that apparently is accidentally together in this module because there's no dependency relation between them. So this is considered low cohesion. There's no obvious reason. There's no strong connection between them. So maybe they should be separate components. It could be easier uh, as a unit of change. Yeah, probably they can be separated. So uh, for cohesion, you want within a component, you want a high cohesion. And amongst components, you want low coupling. If you remember that, high co low coupling, high cohesion, whenever you make a design. Okay. Uh, next, I want to, to delve a little bit more into um, modularity. I apologize for the Dutch on the slide. But the idea is that modularity is a form of isolation. Uh, in the case, if you have a module, the information that's inside, the design decisions that are inside, you want to keep inside. And the, the world outside it shouldn't know it. Uh, here I have a picture which is a reverse engineered picture. A source code was put in and individual classes are represented as a dot in this picture. And there is a line between dots if there is a method call going from one class to another class. So I would say this is a complex picture. And it's, it's not very modular. And I, I have a different picture It, the picture is at least somewhat better, I would say, because there's, uh, there's less spaghetti. Uh, you can see that there's, uh, the density of the coupling between the nodes is lower. But still, the picture is fairly complex, and you cannot really see whether there is a layering or not. So complexity in the sense of spaghetti is the, the largest enemy of the architect. Uh, any serious system for which you will be paid as an academic architect is going to be of this complexity. Okay? If it's smaller, they'll hire someone from a different program, yeah, a lower level of education. You will be faced with the, 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 the difficult design issues. So whenever you recognize that something is moving in this direction, it, is, it will be your task to improve the structure. It becomes intellectually almost impossible to manage eh? if the number of design decisions and the number of modules is not limited by modularity. So what's the importance of modularity? Uh, it is believed to uh, enhance robustness, reliability, correctness. I'll make sure to translate this slide before I uh, dispatch it. Uh, most of the words are close, I think. Maintainability, extensibility, and also reusability and interoperability. So the benefits of, of uh, low coupling that were already mentioned by some of the students. Modules become easier to replace. Um, if there's fewer interconnections, it actually becomes easier to understand. Uh, this is also important mean. Is, is, uh, the, the most prominent use in this is that's a vehicle for communication. If you make a PowerPoint presentation in which you describe your architecture, it is the, the, the common vision of the people that work in this project. So if it becomes difficult to understand, and, and some people think it means left and other people think it means right. So understandability of an architecture is an important vehicle. In the agile community, they promote the use of a metaphor for characterizing architecture. So why is this? Because metaphor brings in a lot of intuition. If it's a blackboard, clearly blackboard is not, physical, it's not a physical blackboard like we have here, but everyone knows the characteristics that go with it. And that's why metaphor is useful. The same for pipeline, client server, all of those are metaphors. Yeah? They're used as styles, but they are essentially metaphors. So other benefits from uh, 
modularity or reusability was mentioned. Also robustness, the ability of defects or faults to propagate from one module to another. If you design systems with a good modularity, this will also have a positive impact on limiting the, the propagation effect of, uh, of faults. And it will ease, by the way, the testing and diagnosis. If a fault occurs, it will be easier to trace back where, where it was caused. This is um, the design of a laptop, I think, where it has um, several subsystems. It has a drive system. I think the example dates from the 90s. Main board, a screen, and uh, some, some packaging. Uh, each of these has subsystems, which are re represented by the rows. And the same uh, subsystems are, you should think of in the columns. Okay? So if there is an X in a, one of these positions, it means there is a subsystem here. It has a dependency on subsystem here. Okay? This type of representation is called a design structure matrix. And it helps you to get insight into the modularity of your system. If you want to make the link with metrics, you can count the number of axes of the diagonal. Why would I want to count it, the axes of diagonal? Who knows what they represent? So if there is a, you can see that the density of the axis in the diagonal is the highest. This means there is a dependency within the same subsystem. So is that a matter of coupling or cohesion? That's cohesion. So if that's cohesion, what's an X outside the diagonal uh, component? That's coupling. Yeah. So here you can see that there is coupling in some areas here and here. So th this technique is also a technique that you can use as maybe a complement or an alternative to architectural conformance. Yeah, you can, instead of using this graph representation, which is used in architectural conformance, you can use a matrix representation. This is a redesign of the same system, where we can see that uh, additional interfaces have been designed, and they are uh, alongside the border. And all of the axes that were outside of the diagonal, th they were able to, to move those into the uh, special interfaces. So here, the design matrix shows a, a higher modularity. Eh? It shows a, a more modular design. I, can, I think I also have a picture for the Netscape. I don't know if, it have, if I have it in this presentation. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is the design structure matrix for the Mozilla browser. It's a browser from, I think, the previous century. I'm not sure. I think so, because this, this is probably the year here, the first... Uh, first four digits is the year. Uh, Mozilla was first developed by a commercial company, and at some point it was being open sourced because they, I think they were losing the battle with uh, Microsoft. And um, when the people started the open source, they said, oh, let's, 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 before we're going to continue, let's first redesign the architecture of the system. Um, Again, you can see uh, the, the, the diagonal has the highest density, so that's cohesion, that's okay. But there's large areas where you can see uh, coupling, uh, many off-diagonal uh, dependencies, both here and here. The good thing about it is that you can identify some of the modules as the, uh, the bottlenecks. Apparently, there's a few modules that are apparently responsible for many of the uh, dependencies. Um, this design has an average dependency of 2.4 per thousand lines of code. And they made a redesign where, first of all, they reduced the number of modules. It's, it's always a good idea to start with. But you can also see that the amount of dependencies outside the diagonal is much smaller. So they have fewer uh, dependencies, a, a more modular design. The number of dependencies per thousand lines of code was reduced to 1.3. Okay, so here you see that this number, 1.3 compared to 2.4, is an indicator of an overall system quality property, namely the modularity. Questions?
for object-oriented design, uh, there is a, a suite of metrics that have been designed by Mr. Shidamber and Kamer. And this metric suite was, I think, one of the first, and it has been uh, dominant in the research in this area. Uh, I'm not going to explain all of them, but we'll look at a few of them. Um, in particular, we look at uh, coupling. Here's an example of uh, a design, and it consists of uh, seven or eight classes, where clearly there is a centralized uh, responsibility in uh, one module, and there's a number of other modules that, it, that are steered by this central component. So you can see the, if you count the coupling, and look in this column, this coupling has a, this module has a coupling of uh, seven. Okay, I'm going to show the same design, but this time refactored. It's the same system. This is the same component that used to be the, the central one here, but now responsibilities have been delegated. Yeah, not everything is centralized, but has been delegated to some other modules. So that means that uh, this is now responsible for communicating with the others, and SAT itself is no longer connected to this. So this is an example of what we discussed in a cohesion uh, or in a coupling uh, discussion. And if you look at the measurements, you see that the maximum in this column, it used to be seven, now the maximum here is three. So the amount of coupling has reduced by changing the topology of the design, and it was achieved by delegating uh, responsibilities. So the, the risk in this design is that this central component is going to bloat. It's going to grow and grow and grow because more logic is going to be uh, added to it. And by having a more delegated logic, uh, we expect that each of the components will grow in a more balanced fashion. Okay, so, it, again, it's an illustration of how the use of metrics can be an indicator of a more maintainable, uh, balanced design. And in this case, it's, design, it's metrics at the design level. Eh? It shows a class diagram. I, I, well, in this case, I happen to have the code, but you can apply it during the design phase. Here's an example of how uh, metrics relate to uh, patterns. I don't know if the facade pattern was uh, discussed. There's a situation where you have a, a package here with several components inside. It's being used by some other components, but each of them makes a direct talk call to some of the internals over here. Okay, so you can count the number of dependencies here, six or seven. It is the facade pattern suggests to replace it by this design, where there's a single gate called the facade, yeah, the, the face to the outside world. All of the external components now have to use this. And this routes the request internally. So it's a better separation of concerns. It's a better information hiding. And it's also reflected by the metrics. If you look at the, the coupling or the fan in, fan out, which is basically the number of ingoing dependencies or the number of outgoing dependencies, you see that the numbers for this design are much nicer than the numbers for this design. So you can look at the patterns, the patterns book, I don't know to what extent it's being discussed, and look at it from the perspective of the metrics, and you would see that all of the patterns, they are uh, they're changing the design in such a way that the metrics are actually nicer. Okay, here's a quiz uh, question. I've explained this coupling notion. Yeah? Suppose I'm going to make a, a histogram of a a system that has at least 100 classes. Now I'm going to make buckets. On this side, I'm going to make a bucket of all the classes that have a coupling of one, and a coupling of two. And on the far end, I'm going to have all the classes that have a coupling of 100. Okay? The number of classes that have this amount of coupling. So how, is to, how, how does this graph look? Is it at a blue line, which means... Uh, equal, I have the same amount of classes with low coupling as with high coupling, is going to increase, I have few classes with low coupling, but many with high coupling, is going to reduce. Okay, well, let's see how we can do this with this amount of students. Uh, let, let's see hands for this purple line. It's going to increase. That's about three, four. How about 
the blue one is going to stay equal across the no one free equal? Yeah, I can have only one vote. Eh? How about the red line? It's going to decrease. Yeah, I think that's a majority. Uh, wh why is that? Yeah, maybe you saw my slides during the break. Yeah, I think the, the red line is closest to reality. Uh, this, is the, this is the histogram for an actual system. I think it's more than 140 classes, though which it mentions here. And you can see that there's many classes with a low coupling, which is good, eh? low coupling is good. But the, the, there's always classes that are high coupling. Eh? It continues all the way up here. In general, you have a pattern where it goes down steeply, and almost like an exp exponential decrease, and it goes on, and it goes on. We have seen systems with coupling of 170. Uh, I would say that's a bit too much, and you should really try to do better. Uh, so this, this gives you a different way of looking at the overall design. Yeah. Again, you can express it in a number, in, or in this case in a distribution, which tells you uh, the, some characteristics of the modularity of your design. I'm also convinced that different classes have different roles. Yeah. Maybe there's some, some data definitions that are here, although sometimes you see a data definition here, and there's many classes using the same data definition. Uh, if you have controllers in your architecture, coordinators, managers, those will end up here too often. Yeah, and apparently, they have many dependencies to, uh, to different types of components. And it is the challenge of the architect to push this down. Eh? These guys, they should go down. Again, uh, it also shows that it's not a matter of uh, black and white. Uh, when we confronted the designer of the system with these measurements, and he said, yeah, I agree with you. It's not a good idea, but I'm not going to change it because we've already implemented it or it's too much effort to change or too costly to change. So it says two things. One, if he would have known earlier, he could have made a better design. And the other thing is sometimes the architect makes a trade-off and he says, now, in this case, I think it's economically better to have this design even though it's worse. But also, it depends very much on the moment in time when you do the measurement. Here's a number of methods per class, also as a distribution. It has a similar pattern. Many classes with a low number of methods, but it continues on all the way down. There's one class with more than 71 methods. So if I were an architect or a quality assurance person in a project, then I would be saying, okay, this is probably okay, but I would ask the architect to look at these guys, at these classes, and say, maybe, maybe you should look at it. Maybe you can uh, uh, adjust your design such that you reduce the number of methods. We've also looked at the depth of inheritance. Uh, different metrics, they have different numbers that are meaningful, and for, in particular, number of methods and coupling, they're often relative to the size of the system. Uh, so if you have if your system has 100, then a coupling of a 10 to 15 is reasonable. For depth of inheritance, we can give an absolute number. That uh, 3 or 4 is manageable, and 6 or 7 is really the maximum, independent of whatever system you'll make. If you have a depth of inheritance that's larger than 7, it's going to be a major headache. Okay. Yeah, it can be, uh, it can be a getter or a setter or uh, yeah, it's an actual industrial system. So I didn't invent the numbers. So it's not necessarily the same system as on the previous slide, though. And there's lots of lots of people trying to uh, harvest data from open source projects, for instance, as many repositories are available and you can try to explore patterns. So what I like to, to see as a master project is someone to figure out what's the role of these guys. What's their role within the system? Are they controllers or managers or uh, uh, are they for uh, security or are they for... No one has ever looked at it. Uh, 
So we have, uh, w during my research here at the university in, uh, in Eindhoven, we've developed a tool called Metric View, and you could feed in a UML design, and it would calculate all these metrics about coupling, cohesion, and number of methods, and it would visualize these uh, on top of the UML design. It could be interactive, and it could help you say, okay, and this class meets your uh, th threshold for equality, and these guys, they don't meet it. It would project histograms, which tell you that the number of methods is so high or it's not so high. And it was a, a graphical way for uh, providing feedback to the designer about the weak spots in his system. And the graphical way worked much better than the tables. And we could give him the numbers that were not so intuitive. Um, it's still available for projects as far as I'm concerned. I don't know if there's anyone in Eindhoven that's willing to supervise it. Otherwise, you can send me an email and I can discuss it. Uh, I put a, a video of the tool online, so you can, uh, can watch uh, YouTube and see how it works. It actually also allowed you to, uh, to create a quality tree. Yeah, say, this is my notion of quality, and I want these notions of metrics as an indicator, and you could select which one to use. And uh, it had a 3D uh, feature which was uh, considered particularly cool by the companies. Ah, I don't mind using a cool tool. So, I'm approaching the end of my, uh, my lecture. Um, there's one result that I would like to share with you about the effectiveness of uh, architecting or modeling. Uh, I should keep with effect first and try to generalize afterwards. This graph shows the data from an uh, industrial system where we created a metric for the level of detail in a UML design. Okay, we could, on a per class basis, we could say how much information is in the design and we would particularly look at the sequence diagrams. You could say if it's low level of detail, it mentioned maybe some informal term, a high level of detail, and then it would mention the method name, the type that was being used, maybe return types. Um, the numbers here range from low detail to high detail um, and they, they turn into negative because a statistical transformation was used but that's not the most important part and the other thing that we calculated per metric is we would go through the defect database and per defect we would uh, just count how many defects were found for each individual class and together with that we would measure okay how is this class modeled, what's the level of detail. And on the x-axis here you see the level of detail, on the y-axis the defect density. So the pattern that you see is, goes a bit like this. It shows if you have a higher level of detail, you have lower defect density in your implementation. And that's basically what we hoped and wished for as a, a believers in modeling and upfront design. It shows it pays off to, uh, to invest in the quality of your design, because you can expect a lower number of defects in your implementation. Anyone have questions about that? Uh, the, the other thing that you can see, or can expect, statistically it's not going to go below here. You're not going to go below zero defects. There's actually diminishing returns. If you're going to increase your model further and further, it's not going to reduce your defects proportionally. You're going to reduce fewer defects as far as you promote, as you approach perfection. And this is what you can basically expect from the cost of quality model also. Eh? You're not going to reach uh, zero defects. So I'll move into the summary of the, of the lecture. Um, the metrics, the notion of metrics that I've shown, they are a means and they're an indicator for particular quality properties in the design. Their advantages are they're objective. Well, uh, if you can compute it and you can mention which definition you've used, someone else will get the same result, which is not the same for a review or inspection. They're incremental in the sense that you can start using it when your design is not finished. You don't need the complete design or the source code to start using metrics. Because if they are poor design, decisions like high coupling, it will already be indicated. 
The application of metrics can be very fast. I showed there's a tool around. There's many tools for metrics at the code level. There are some tools around for metrics at the design level. Uh, and it requires little effort to apply it. So basically, it's low-hanging fruit. If you're a quality assurance person, you just ask your project to use it. And it's a low effort, high benefit. Um, what's considered a weakness uh, is that, okay, uh, if you get a coupling of a seven, you don't know yet whether it's a good or a bad number. So it requires some expertise in interpreting what these numbers mean. I, think that, I don't think that's a showstopper or a difficulty. So be going beyond the summary on metrics, a summary on the lecture as a whole for today, uh, we started with emphasizing the importance of requirements yeah, because the, the stakeholders, they determine what are the important quality properties of the overall system. And the, 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 the summary of the advice is Get feedback early and often. Involve your stakeholders early and also throughout the development. Ask them, are we on the right track? Establish your priorities between quality, schedule and cost because there is likely to be a trade-off and it will help you prioritize and will help you in motivating your design decisions. To know and to apply your design principles Keep it simple, separation of concerns, information hiding, modularity, keep things together that belong together. Yeah. And the, the application of those slides is supported through design metrics. The design metrics will help you identify weak spots during the design phase of your project. And they can, at the early stages of the design, save you lots of headaches later on. And with that, I would like to end today's lecture. Are there any questions? Thank you for the lecture. My pleasure.